Welcome to Life to the Full, a message to Christians. This is a podcast about the abundant life that God promises in Scripture. We want to inspire those who are frustrated with themselves and their communities to live a transformed life that will impact the world. Our primary purpose is to be a platform that will impact the world through conversation. We want to invite others to connect and unite in curiosity, vulnerability, and responsibility. A transformed life is about growth, learning, and evolving. A transformed life leads to transformed communities, and transformed communities impact the world. One conversation at a time. All right, guys, well, welcome back to uh, Life to the Full podcast, a message to Christians. And we are going to be going on a short journey, three short journeys, actually, into scripture. We're going to be looking at some narrative. We're going to be looking at some poetry, and we're going to be looking at some prose discourse. So we're going to be doing the book of Jonah. We're going to do a bunch of Psalms, and then we're going to do a letter of Paul. Haven't Still haven't settled on it yet, whether it's going to be the book of Ephesians or if it's going to be the letter to Philemon. But, you know... We'll get there eventually, I'm sure. By the time I actually sit down to record this, I'll know what I'm doing. But then again, you never know. Sometimes I just jump in. Hey, let's go for it. So, all right. So last time we were together, we talked about the big story of the Bible by looking at the Bible itself, at some of those editorial comments, at the closing in, at closing and beginning of books, major sections in the Hebrew scriptures to kind of get an idea of what all this could be about. Uh, So today we're gonna be looking at intentional design inside the book of Jonah. And we're not gonna have to get very, very far at all uh, to kind of get an idea of what's going on. So we're gonna go right to Jonah one versus one to two. And at some point we might read the whole thing together on a podcast, um, just because I wanna make sure that you guys are actually reading this book. It's so short, it's so easy to read it and just about think eight to 10 minutes, uh, you can get through the whole thing. It's really not that bad. Um, But we're going to, you know, be going a little slow here. Again, we want to, we're going on this journey together. We want to know where are we, right? So intentional design, Jonah one to two. I have two translations here up on the screen. I have the new American standard and I have the ESV. Uh, In Jonah one, verses one and two in a new American standard, it reads the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city and cry against it for their wickedness has come up before me. And in the English standard version, it says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai saying, arise, go to the, go to Nineveh, that great city and call out against it for their evil has come up before me. So this is already going to give us so many important clues and you really could follow some of these clues, uh, contextual clues, textual hints, really back and forth throughout the entire scriptures. We're not, we're going to just look at a few, but we're going to look at a few of the most obvious ones, right? We're not going to get too much into Hebrew, like, you know, Jonah meeting dove, we're not going to get into, you know, different things that, you know, we're we're trying to just look at surface level, what you can see, what you could do on your own. You know, that's pretty, here, it's pretty easy. You could just go to BibleGateway.com or, you know, another Bible software, like the Blue Letter Bible, which is free or Logos, which is not free, but it is amazing. I'm so grateful that, you know, my seminary seminary classes, I get to use Logos. It's just been, whoa. <laughs> you know, I've been uh, playing around with it for a few weeks now. I still haven't scratched the surface of all these tools. It's, it's something that, I mean, if you get a chance to play around with it, it's, it's worth every penny. I mean, I get it at a severely discounted rate um, as part of my tuition, but, uh, you know, highly worth it. If you're, if you're responsible for doing any type of preaching, any type of speaking, running any type of discussions, or even just for your own personal Bible study, highly recommend getting something like like it. But there, you know, there are tools that you can use just for free, and you can just you can just search. 
So some of the some of the clues that might jump out at you is if you look at a few different translations, you notice the word now is is or and is in some and it's not in others. Uh, you could look at Jonah, the son of Amittai. You could say, okay, is that ever in scriptures? Uh, you can, you know, search for that. And, you know, you can look at a few other things. So we're going to do that now together. So the first thing that we come to is the word now. Okay. Uh, now I, I just said I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do it. Uh, really, the translation is more of like it's and, you know, and. And uh, if you've ever been in a conversation, which I'm sure all of you have had a chance to do conversations, uh, you don't really hear people beginning a conversation going, and, you know, usually that comes, there's, there's some stuff before it, like, you know, like, I tried to cross the street, and did you believe it? Like, I almost got hit by a car, or something like that, or, you know, I was climbing a mountain, and I found a Dunkin' Donuts on top of the mountain, do you believe that? I had, I sat, and I had some lattes, and it was great. Probably more of a Starbucks guy, personally, uh, but, you know, you can't beat Dunkin' for the economy, and the cost of their coffee, and the ability to just get it quick, get in, get out. But anyway, most people don't don't start a story or a conversation with the word "end," right? It's like a transitional phase phrase. It usually means there's just something that came before it. So if you were going through, and a lot of the translators did this, they kind of just took that word out because it just it seemed like you don't really need it. Uh, when you're thinking about a self-contained story. But see, the problem is Jonah isn't a self-contained story and it kind of never was. So I think we talked, to, do I have a, I should add that here. So if you look at this diagram that I have here, right, for where the book of Jonah is located, uh, you know, for most of its history, we don't really know. If, I mean, obviously, you know, it was written out by itself at one point, but it was kept together and it was kept together in a series of prophetic works called the 12. So there were 12 prophets, you know, you know, and that Jonah is kind of sandwiched in between, right? Even though it doesn't read like what we would think of in a modern Christian sense as prophecy, you know, necessarily, it seems more like it reads more like satire, or right? because it is a story, it's narrative. Um, it's it never really had a life, an intellectual life on its own, where people were reading it and circulating it in isolation. It was always with these other prophets. So I kind of just throw that in there to just understand that you know we are in the middle of an ongoing story. This is our second clue. Jonah, the son of Amittai. So you can easily go to a BibleGateway.com, a Blue Letter Bible, or some other Bible software, or you can go old school and you can get one of those big, they look like telephone books. And a lot of you guys don't even know what I'm saying when I say a telephone book. How could there be a book of telephones? Um, or do you like a cell phone? Like, guys are all confused. All right. So anyway, there used to be these big books called commentaries where every single word in the Bible was cataloged and there was a little reference ticker right there about where to find that. But anyway, do the easy thing, go to your computer, go to your cell phone, type in Jonah, the son of Amittai and see if anything comes up. And what you'll find is that it does. And so where that's gonna lead you, it's gonna lead you out, okay, to the book of Kings, second Kings. And then that in itself, and in 2 Kings uh, chapter 15, you're going to find him. Uh, and we're going to read this together. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria and reigned 41 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, Jeroboam the son of Nabat, which he made Israel sin. He restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Hamath as far as the Sea of Araba, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke through his servant Jonah, 
the son of Amittai, the prophet who was of Gath Hefer. For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, which was very bitter, for there was neither bond nor free, nor was there any helper for Israel. The Lord did not say he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, but he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. Now, everyone always complains about the Israelite kings. Uh, a lot of them have similar sounding names. Um, you know, in some ways that almost kind of like makes you feel like, all right, this actually can be a real story about real people, or there's some grain of truth there. Um, because that's, that's what tends to happen when people are great or they perceive themselves to be great. They tend to, you know, name things after themselves. And, you know, kings of the past, this isn't just a Israelite thing, uh, often did that. They gave themselves similar sounding names or you know, names that gave honor or tribute to the kings or the people that came before them, which, you know, can always make the job of historians, uh, archaeologists, very difficult <laughs> to try and keep straight everyone who they're talking about. So I'll give you the cliff notes. So there was a king, right, who was not a good king but he reigned for a very long time. I'm 42 now. So he reigned 41 years. So he's, he reigned almost as long as I've been alive. So that's a, it's a long time for me right now, thinking about it, that, you know, this person was a, a king. If I lived in a monarchy and there was a king who reigned 41 years, I wonder how long Queen Elizabeth uh, has reigned in England. Um, you know, obviously it's different, you know, she doesn't have supreme power in England or the UK where this king did, um, you know, to reign 41 years without getting killed or assassinated or, you know, something terrible happening to you outside looking in, I don't know, that sounds like a great kingship to me. Uh, but here in the biblical uh, review, <laughs> I love how you know, the Bible kind of summarizes all these kings' entire work and lifetime into like one or two lines. They were good or they were bad. You know, it doesn't matter anything else they did. Uh, it says he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel sin. So he led Israel into sin. Um, obviously, it's not telling us here exactly what that sin is. That's something that we'd have to We'd have to pull back farther, which we're not going to do here. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, God wasn't happy with this king. But then something interesting happens. So God's not happy with this king, but he ends up blessing Israel anyway, which is curious. A lot of times, like if you're just reading through the Bible, you know, a lot of times, you know, people don't really get this far into the book of Kings. Uh, they'll stick more of like the words of Paul, which feel easier, which are really not. As we'll see, um, it seems like something great happened. You know, he, he restored the borders of Israel from the entrance of Hamath as far as the Sea of Araba, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke through. Who did he speak this through? His servant, Jonah, the son of Amittai. This is the person we've been looking for, right? We want to find out... What, what's going on here? You know, the prophet. So Jonah was part of ministering to, you know, Israel, right? Um, and he got to prophesy to a king that in God's estimation was not a great king, but which God blessed. Uh, he blessed his people. Why does he do it? It says in verse 26, for the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, which was very bitter, for there was neither bond nor free, nor there was any helper for Israel. So despite the fact that Jeroboam was not a great king, uh, the fight, despite the fact that you know he led Israel into sin, God chose to bless Israel anyway. And so, you know, this is kind of the context that we're being dropped into. This is 2 Kings 15. The idea of the golden days, right? He was prophet during the reign of Jeroboam II. God saw how terrible things were. So he increased the size of their land. It doesn't even make sense to me. So God saw how terrible, how wicked people were. So he decided to bless them, right? And the borders are basically as big as they were during the time of Solomon. 
according to this, according to what was happening here. Uh, and Solomon's reign is kind of like the gold standard of uh, prosperity for the monarchy, for the kingdom of Israel. It was the kingdom was divided. I'm sorry, the kingdom was united still under Solomon, uh, while David was maybe, uh, you know, seen more as a guy after a man after God's own heart, kind of like a um, model of a perfect king, a perfect anointed one. Um, Solomon's reign was kind of the example of the most prosperous. Uh, so God did this for them, despite the fact that the king was wicked. And he did that through the prophetic work of Jonah, son of Amittai, in partnership with an evil king. So you have to keep that in your, in your mind as you go forward into this, that we don't really know much about Jonah yet, but we do know that he was uh, part of an administration that saw a great amount of blessing, and it happened through his prophetic work. So I think about that you know, even like in terms of like building a church or, you know, building a community of believers, a lot of times when good things are happening, we can kind of get lost in the good things that are happening and think that they have to do with us, where no, they don't have to do necessarily with us. They have to do with God's choice. God can choose to bless or he can choose not to bless. Uh, and here, in spite the fact of, you know, people were in a lot of sin and the administration or monarchy was also, you know, leading people to sin. God was not pleased with them. Um, God chose to bless them and bless them in a way that brought about, you know, the reestablishment of the kingdom that hadn't been seen since the time of Solomon. So this is a big deal. <clears throat> and then what happens, right? It, next chapter, you know, all of this is kind of reversed. And in days of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath, Plazar, king of Assyria, came and captured Ejon and Abel Machach, I'm not pronouncing it, I'm sure, and Genoa and Kadesh and Hazor and Gilead and Galilee, all the land of the Nephali. And he carried them captive to Assyria. And Hosea, the son of Elah, made a conspiracy against Pekah, the son of Ramila, and struck him and put him to death and became king in his place. In the 20th year of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, now the rest of the acts of Pekah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. So again, it might be hard to track here now because we're, we're kind of trying to move through this quickly, but there's this idea, right? That there were good times and the good times were through this prophetic work of the character of Jonah, right? He was the prophet to a king right? Prophets are supposed to lead kings. They're supposed to teach kings all uh, the law, help minister them, uh, help them to, you know, do what's right. But Jonah here, presumably, even though through his prophecy, the kingdom was established into these glory days that hadn't been seen through the time of Solomon, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that Jonah had been doing a good job as well as really being a prophet to the king, because the king was not a good king. Uh, but then one chapter later, God kind of reverses everything. He, we've got a quick list of names that the king of Assyria took back, which kind of correlate to, uh, you know, losing of that territory. So there were the golden days, there were the best of times. And then right away, chapter later, there was the worst of times. God reverses all of those blessings that he gave through Jonah. So, you know, we get a new address here. So Jonah lived um, and prophesied, we know, during 2 Kings 14, um, during the golden days. And, uh, you know, chapter later, God kind of took all that stuff away. So the idea here of Jonah, right? So there's a story that, that should be surrounding the book of Jonah of this idea of God working in a powerful way to bless his people despite their sin, only to take that blessing away. That should, that should be in your head as you go forward into this story, um, right? And we have another thing. And this thing might've been a little bit harder to spot, right? Calls Nineveh that great city. Again, 
We'll read this time from the ESV. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. So it goes right into this phrase, the great city. Maybe it jumped out at you. Um, you know, it is kind of like weird for God to be calling Nineveh a great city uh, when you think about it, because, you know, Nineveh is a pagan city. It's not one of God's cities, it's not in Jerusalem. It's, you know, the capital of Assyria, Nineveh. So you might, you know, pull out your concordance, pull out your Bible software on your phone or wherever you use it, and, you know, type in that great city to see where that was ever used anywhere else in the Bible. And what you'll find is that that exact phrase is used again in the Bible. And it's only used really one other time. And that's in Genesis 10. So it's used twice overall, one in the book of Jonah and one in Genesis 10, uh, where, you know, again, Nineveh is referred to as the great city. Nineveh, the great city in Genesis 10. Um, we'll, we'll just read it. Let's just go for it. And where do I want to begin? This plops us right down into the middle of a genealogy. Uh, you know, when you, which are terrible in one sense, uh, but once you get to understand them, they're kind of like really, really cool. And they're actually kind of fascinating. You can get a lot of stuff uh, from these when you just read them carefully. So let's go in and let's do that together. So beginning in verse... Um, so basically, this is called the Table of Nations. So if you can imagine, uh, this is kind of the record of after Noah, Noah gets out of the ark, right? He has his three, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jephthah, and it kind of talks about uh, their history, right? So you get what's called the Table of Nations, or these are all the nations that were around uh, the Israelites. So this is like the story of their foundation if you will you know the, the idea of that all of all of humanity comes from the same family right extend that idea outwards so when you get to genesis 10 and verse 6 the descendants of ham cush mizram put canaan the descendants of cush sheba havila sabat rama and septeka the descendants of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. And verse 8, Cush also begot Nimrod, who was the first man of might on earth. So this is kind of cool when the gene genealogies do this, and this should clue you in that something important is happening here, right? Because you found that, that term, the great city. So now you're going to follow it back to see what we're talking about. So Cush also begot Nimrod. Uh, who was the first man of might on earth. He was a mighty hunter by the grace of the Lord. Hence the saying, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter by the grace of the Lord. The mainstays of his kingdom were Babylon, Erek, Akkad, and Kalneh, in the land of Shinar. From that land, Ashur went forth and built Nineveh. So here's our city, Nineveh. Reboth er Kala. Don't know if I pronounced that right and resin between Nineveh and Kala, that is the great city. So it's kind of telling you where Nineveh is, it's kind of giving you that idea, right? And it's up there on the screen as well. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys are probably uh, laughing at the way I pronounced a lot of that stuff, but it talks about Nineveh, this great city. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting language because Babylon throughout the stories of the scripture, it's kind of like that big bad that is like in the background, right? Even in the beginning, Genesis uh, 1 to 11, like, you know, Cain goes and builds a city. Um, some biblical scholars uh, feel very strongly that that city is the foundation of Babylon. Um, you know, there, there's a tower called Babel, which really is just means Babylon, basically. Um, and as you go through the scriptures, Babylon is kind of there, like lurking in the background. And ultimately, God uses Babylon to end the nation of Israel, right? Sends them into exile. Uh, we don't 
talk about the exile enough as Christians when we're reading our Bible. It's, you know, the first three quarters of it is all kind of, you know, arranged and organized in the shadow of that exile. Um, and, you know, it has a lot of stuff there for us as Christians. But anyway, so here are textual, textual clues that we looked at. Okay. So just from lines one to two, it kind of sends us first into Kings, right? Uh, second Kings 14, 15, time of prosperity under an evil king uh, through the work of the prophet Jonah. And then all of that is taken away, right? By God, a chapter later, all that's kind of reversed by Nineveh, right? That in our Jonah one, first two lines, kind of God just told Jonah to arise and go to Nineveh. And then it sends us back with that term, the great city, right? It sends us back into Genesis 10, right? And so keeping all this mind, a whole big story of scripture that we talked about at first of, you know, what this prophet to come uh, who meditate on the Torah day and night, we get the story of this prophet, right? Who all the stuff that has happened to is going to the city that goes back to the foundations of the biblical story. So what's going on here, guys? <laughs> you know, this was just one sentence two verses, one sentence, right? It sent us to second Kings 14 and 15. Uh, but then if, again, there was things that were happening in uh, second Kings 14 and 15 that we didn't really have time to talk to talk about. We didn't know what the sin was because it said, Oh, they did the sin of so-and-so. Right. So you'd have to back up and understand the rest of the story of Kings. And then, you know, to understand the story of Kings, right. First and second Kings, you really have to understand the foundation of the monarchy. So you have to go back to first and second Samuel to read the story of David and Solomon. Right. And then that's going to even send us back into the Torah and to, into, you know, the first five books up through Joshua, the time of the judges. Right. So it is, it's assuming that we're tracking here. It's telling us the stories that we need to be keeping on the forefront of our minds as we go into the narrative. Right. Uh, but it's, it's sending us out. So, and it even sent this out to the table of nations with that term, the great city, only used one other place. You know, but you need, then you need to know this, the significance of the table of nations. What is, and how does that fit into the rest of Genesis 1 to 11? So you have to understand, you know, this is, this is on purpose. This is the way the Bible works. The Bible works by referencing itself. Um, it assume, assumes that you've read through this multiple times on multiple occasions over a long period of time and that you're able to track of all this. Um, you know, like if, if the writers of the New Testament and the Old Testament could see even the, the power that we have with our, you know, computer searches, our online commentaries, our biblical dictionaries, they would have lost their minds about, you know, how much power we have to really connect the dots here that can kind of like, you know, sometimes give us a little bit of an edge. Like you don't necessarily have to have this whole thing memorized and downloaded in your brain to do this. You can do this, you know, in a few minutes by just typing some words into, you know, an online concordance to see if anything, if there's any connections, there's anything there. Um, but you have to understand that every single page of the Bible works like this. You cannot get away from it especially with narratives narratives love these textual clues that are going to send you all over the place and i know it can make people feel very very overwhelmed at first i know i was when i first uh you know learned this and it, i like to bring up this analogy given to me by uh nt wright in, in one of his books i believe it was scripture and the authority of god where it talks about imagine imagine taking your car uh for an oil change or there's something wrong with your car, maybe something's wrong with your transmission, you take it to your mechanic and the mechanic says, all right, you know, pick it up at such and such time. And when you come back, they're like, hey, come into the back, I wanna show you something. And they've basically taken apart your car, taken apart your engine, and they've kind of like arranged everything, maybe very artistically out here. And, you know, there's diagrams and labels and they're like, hey, look what I did. And you're like, oh, oh, wow. like." <laughs> will my car ever work again? Will my car ever, you know, function again? And uh, this is kind of where we're left here. 
but don't be afraid. The Bible itself will teach you how to do this. Oh, we just did this. It really wasn't that hard. Uh, and after time, it's going to become second nature to you. But we're going to end up end off this episode, right? Kind of talking about a challenge. We love challenges here. And we're going to, the challenge we're going to talk about today is the idea of a thick version reading of scripture versus a thin reading of scripture. And we want to encourage everyone who's listening with us, everyone who's here with us on this journey to start today or tomorrow or as soon as you can uh, reading scripture, what we call thickly. So a thin reading of scripture would be maybe going in verse by verse, uh, taking it very, very slowly. You know, maybe you could go through like a letter of Paul in like a week or two or even a month or a whole season, a season on Ephesians, a season on, on Corinthians, right? You're going in, you're kind of dissecting and taking all the practical applications that you can versus a thick reading of scripture. is just trying to read as much of this as you can every time you sit down. And that's what I'm going to advocate for. Uh, I'm jealous of all of you who are going to be doing this for the first time. Um, the first time I did this, it was life-changing, completely changed the trajectory of my life, uh, and life of my you know studies, my biblical studies, my relationship with God. It changed everything. And I'm excited for all of you who are going to be getting to do this for the very first time. All right, guys, uh, thank you so much for spending this time with us, whether you're, you're watching us, watching the video, following along with the scriptures, or um, following along with the slides, I should say, or you're just you know listening to us in your ear. Super excited to have you guys. Uh, talk to you all soon. Do not worry. Patty will be back soon. I know Patty is the most interesting part of this podcast. You guys aren't coming just to see me. You want to see us both. Don't worry. She's coming back. All right, guys. Talk to you later. And as all, adios, muchachos.